In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. Because of the attacks that happened in Sri Lanka, I thought it was appropriate to take a break from our series on Daniel and talk about some other things specifically with Christians being persecuted. Now, to really understand this story, you do need to understand what's going on here. Peter, for preaching the gospel and doing the work of God, doing what Christ commanded him and the other apostles to do in the Great Commission, he has been imprisoned, imprisoned by King Herod. And so, despite doing everything he was supposed to do, despite loving God and, and loving Christ and wanting to do the best that he could to become a fearless warrior for the kingdom that we know he did, he did become, he has been imprisoned for his beliefs. He has been persecuted for believing that Christ is the Son and preaching that word to other people. And this is not the first time. We see earlier in Acts 4, for example, he is beaten for this. And so he's somebody that is unfortunately accustomed now to seeing persecution for the cause of Christ. But at this point, he is locked up, and there is suspicion that he is going to be executed very quickly. The Bible says as much that he's probably going to die in the morning. And yet on that evening... Before he is to be executed, he's suddenly released from captivity, miraculously. And I won't go into all the details because I want to specifically zero in on one aspect of this story, and that aspect is found uh, right here in the book of Acts, chapter 12, verses 12 through 15. And it reads, And when he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, who was also called Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. When he knocked at the door of the gate, a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer. When she recognized Peter's voice, because of her joy, she did not open the gate, but ran in and announced that Peter was standing in front of the gate. They said to her, You are out of your mind, but she kept insisting that it was so. They kept saying, It is an angel. It is his angel. Now, remember that since we're talking about Christian persecution, this is in the very early days of persecution. For a long time, the Jews were persecuting Christians, but the Romans hadn't really caught on, and Herod being sort of a puppet king of, of Rome, he's not somebody that was real concerned with this. But now, the day of Pentecost has already transpired, the church has finally been established here on earth, and a little bit of time has passed, and so this thing is starting to gain momentum. It is, it is starting to really scare people in power. It is starting to really scare people that are in authority under the Roman government because their power is being challenged by people that follow a higher calling than they do. They follow a heavenly king more than they do an earthly king. They're not causing problems or riots or anything like that, but for people in authority... They do get really scared of spiritual people because those are people that cannot be so easily intimidated by threats of physical harm or their worldly authority being used against them. And that does terrify people in positions of authority. And so what you have here is Herod essentially being challenged by Peter, imprisons him and is planning to put him to death, and yet Peter is released by God. And he comes to this home where people are praying for Peter. And because he's been imprisoned, he, his church family has gathered together to pray fervently for him. They've all met together specifically for this purpose. And this little slave girl, it says that she's so excited that she doesn't open the gate. I kind of imagine it that she is somebody obviously that is familiar with Peter because she recognizes the man's voice. That when she hears him, it's kind of those things where you get goofy or awkward on a date when you're really young or something like that, that even though it's a common sense thing, 
uh, you just kind of lose yourself in the excitement that she is so thrilled, that she is so happy that Peter has come to her, that he has returned out of his imprisonment, that she runs in to inform the others, hey, Peter's here. Peter's back. He got out of prison somehow. And she's so sure of that. This little servant girl is going back to the people in there, the, the body of Christ, praying fervently for Peter, an apostle, to return to them. And when she does, she's met with this, not animosity per se, but a strong disbelief, saying that, oh, well, this is Peter's angel or Peter's ghost, or and, and I guess maybe they thought he had already been executed, or that a Peter bearing... That a boy, or sorry, an angel bearing Peter's voice had come to them to speak to them, or something's going on. But whatever it is, they're sure it ain't Peter. They are convinced that Peter is not there because why? Peter is in jail under Herod's authority. I want you to think about that for a minute. These are Christians that have undergone persecution. These are Christians that are living in the first century, and yet they're the ones that are convinced that their prayers are not working. They met together specifically to pray for Peter. And when their prayers are answered by God, they don't even believe that it's happening. I think that some of us in the church, and I've probably been guilty of this too, pray, but we don't really have faith that it's doing anything. Brothers and sisters, as somebody that has, in a very personal and effective way, experienced the good that prayer does, and I'm talking about specifically in my bout with cancer, that I had a recovery that just blew my doctor's minds, how fast I was able to get over it, and how little the chemo affected me. I don't have a shred of doubt anywhere in my mind that that was directly because I had so many people praying for me. And for those of you that are watching that did that, you have my eternal gratitude for that. But I think that even when we do pray for somebody that's sick, even when we do pray for somebody that is imprisoned or facing persecution, sometimes we as Christians don't even really believe that it's doing what it's supposed to that we pray because we think that we should and we think it's the right thing to do and we told them that we were going to, but sometimes we pray thinking, okay, but it really doesn't change anything. And even after my battle with, uh, with cancer and, and going through chemo and all that, there are even times where I find myself in that mindset. That I get to the point where I think, well, all I can do is pray, like that's not really going to do anything. Here's a Bible story of early Christians that had actually seen miracles happen with their own eyes and lived amongst the apostles, thoroughly unconvinced that their prayers are having any effect or that it is making any kind of change. And who is it that rushes in, that has a sure faith, that knows that it's Peter? A little servant girl. Now, we don't know this girl's age. I'm guessing probably a teenager or not far from it. But the point is that she goes in, and this is the person that has more faith than anybody else present. And I think maybe that's part of the reason that Christ calls us to have a childlike faith. The full maturity and wisdom of an adult, combined with that faith of a child that really believes that God makes a difference in their lives that believes if they ask, they shall be given. And so this is a really strong, powerful faith that we can all model. Brothers and sisters, I encourage you to pray for the Christians in Sri Lanka and that are being persecuted the world over, both here in America, but in much more severe circumstances elsewhere in the world, in places like China where it's illegal to be a Christian in places like the Middle East where they kill Christians on a regular basis. And don't you dare for a second think that it doesn't make a difference, because it does. Even when you may not necessarily feel like it makes a difference, it does. The Lord is hearing your prayers, and he's answering just like he was here, just like he did with Peter 
and the group of Christians that assemble to pray for him. Even when you don't feel like your prayers are making a huge difference, don't think that way because your prayers do make a difference. When you say thoughts and prayers heading your way, actually pray for that person and mean it because your prayers do make a difference. Stay the course, friends. Normally, this is the part of the video where you would expect me to ask you to like the video and subscribe to the channel. But the truth is, I don't really care whether you do or not. In fact, you know what? Don't subscribe. It's not like there's a lot of really important stuff going on in the world in the state of Alabama that you should probably be aware of. So, yeah, go ahead and subscribe. Or don't. I don't really care. Reverse psychology. Boom.